in today's lecture, I want to discuss Robert Frost, and I'll talk about some of the poetry I asked you to read. But before we get into all of that, I want to do something that I often don't do. I want to identify some important dates when thinking about Robert Frost. He was born in 1874, and he died in 1963. And I think this is important because Robert Frost became a poet, and he wrote poetry during this high modern period. And of course, he wrote poetry after, but Briefly, some of the characteristics of modernism, at least those that are important when thinking about Frost. Modernism, in many ways, rejected some of the cultural narratives that we all inherit. And when thinking about poetry, and of course, writers, poets, playwrights, artistic folk were doing this at the beginning of the 20th century. But when thinking about poetry, what that means, when thinking about, again, these kinds of inherited narratives, traditions, and expectations, at that point, you're perhaps thinking about things like meter and rhyme patterns, particular ways of writing poetry that are quite formal and quite traditional, because what we see during the modern period is, is this embrace of perhaps free verse, stream of consciousness, again, trying to think about, at least specifically regarding poetry, trying to think about making poetry that, again, defies and antagonizes some of these traditions and some of these assumed and inherited expectations. But... What's really interesting about Frost is that while he wrote during this period and while he produced poetry during this period, he seemed to have an affection and an affinity for, whether it's rhyming patterns, meter form, he seemed to have an affection for these poetic forms. And I think he understood something profound about poetic forms, such as blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. What I think Frost ultimately understood is how traditional forms of poetry have this effect, perhaps, of resisting time by embracing something permanent, and for Frost, that's poetic forms, as opposed to something disordered like free verse poetry or just modernism at large. And Frost actually described this as, quote, a momentary stay against confusion. And again, I wanted to mention this because when you put Frost in conversation with some of his contemporaries, he might seem like something of an anomaly, and I'm speaking quite broadly now, but that anomalous status is one that I think we should just pause over and consider. Because again, I think for a figure like Frost, rhyme and meter and just poetic form, it's this way of, of again, opposing some of the disorder of not just modernist aesthetic movements, but perhaps as a way of opposing the disorder and the chaos of just the 20th century. And now, of course, he died in 1963. But even when you think about the 21st century and how just chaotic and disordered everything seems, for someone like Frost, I think just the simplest way to say it is he found something profoundly reassuring in form and order. So today, part of what I want to do is actually just talk about how he uses form, whether, again, and he doesn't use it as consistently as you might think. Sometimes there's a distinct meter pattern, and I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. But at other times, even within the same poem, he breaks from it. And this is something that I want to highlight today as well. Those times within particular poems when he breaks from these established forms and established conventions. But when thinking about Frost, I think it's also important to just highlight and emphasize how Frost, he, he's certainly representative of this movement that, and we saw this with Mary Austin last week, 
he's he's certainly representative of this movement that we could perhaps broadly call or define as just regionalism because Robert Frost is associated quite intimately with the American Northeast and New England, that whole area. So much of his poetry, whether it explicitly says so or not, feels set in that part of the country. And, and what we're seeing here, again, poetry and literature, not about these big, broad, universal themes and universal ideas that seem detached from particular moments in time and particular regions, but we're seeing literature, and in this case, poetry, about a distinct moment in time, about a distinct region. And that's one of the reasons why Frost is revered. But something else that people really like about Frost is, is just how conversational his poetry sounds. It's poetry, but students often tell me it doesn't feel like poetry. It has this, this mundane and unassuming quality to it. There's also these lovely moments of spontaneity. And that's something that I want to talk about today as well. But before I talk about particular poems, I want to define some of these terms for you. So the first is meter. And when thinking about poetry, meter is simply how many syllables are in a line. And, and this is perhaps less important, but I think it's just worth identifying. Where should you as the reader, and maybe more importantly, where has the poet placed the emphasis with these syllables. So I've mentioned something called iambic pentameter. And if you are familiar with the work of William Shakespeare, either his poetry, which is to say his sonnets, or his plays, Shakespeare wrote almost exclusively in what is called iambic pentameter. And so what is iambic pentameter? Well, each line of iambic pentameter has 10 syllables. And the way we're meant to read it is to not stress a syllable, then stress the next syllable. So what's called an iambic foot, so, so one syllable in iambic pentameter is unstressed, stressed. And here's just an example. This is one of Shakespeare's sonnets, the first line. Again, if you wanted to really emphasize those different syllables, the unstressing and the stressing, it would sound something like this. Shall I... Compare the two a summer's day. And the line is, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Ten syllables, unstressed, stressed. And there are different sorts of meter patterns. For example, there's something called iambic tetrameter, and that's, that's eight syllables, but it follows that same unstressed, stressed pattern. I won't talk about meter that much, but it's something that I, I just wanted to mention. And I might release a short video later this week just so you have something visual you can see, because I know, especially with meter, it's, it's a lot better if you can actually just see it. And then, of course, there's rhyming patterns. And this is something that a lot of you might already know, perhaps it's something you learned in comp too, but just as a reminder, when thinking about rhyming patterns, you are really thinking about the, the sound produced at the end of a line and, and if and when it's repeated, because it often follows a distinct pattern. Again, I'll make reference to Shakespeare. Shakespearean sonnets, each, each quatrain or each four-line section has a distinct rhyming pattern. And Shakespeare actually just alternates, almost always. So that first four-line cluster, it's A, B, A, B. And what that means is that for lines one and three, the final sound, it's basically the same. And, and that's true for lines two and four. And he repeats that pattern throughout the sonnet until the very end with what's called a two-line couplet. And in that two-line couplet, the, the same sound, it's repeated with those two lines. So again, I might release something, again, a visual companion later this week, so you have something you can actually see, because I think that might make it a bit easier. But I just wanted to identify those terms in particular, because when I talk about them, and if I talk about them, because I will, but I won't necessarily with every poem, but when I talk about them with the three poems that I want to discuss today, I want to make sure that everyone understands 
essentially what I mean. So, okay, with all of that said, let's transition to the pasture. So the three poems that I want to talk about in this lecture, I want to talk about the pasture, I want to talk about the road not taken, and I want to talk about stopping by woods on a snowy evening. So let's start with the pasture. This is on page 219. And because these poems are quite short, what I think I'll do, I'll just actually read the poems. So follow along with me, and then I'll offer a bit of commentary. Okay, follow along with me. I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear, I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young. It totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long. You come too. So maybe one of the first things I would ask you is, well, what's your initial reaction to this poem? Because I think this poem in particular gives us a sense of perhaps some of Frost's aesthetic and poetic preoccupations. Notice this is a pastoral setting, and there doesn't seem to be a lot happening here, but I think that's part of the point, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But I would also ask you to consider, what does the speaker seem to value in this poem? Because all literature, whether it's a short poem like this or something like The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, there are distinct values inherent in the text. Values produce the text. So what do you think Frost values with this poem? Again, this is a smaller setting. This is a, this is a, it seems just from the poem, a smaller world. The stakes don't necessarily seem that big or that high. Just think about this poem in relation to the stories I asked you to read last week. The stakes are so much lower here. And even when thinking about how nature, how Frost depicts nature, comparing it to perhaps the Jack London story from last week or the Stephen Crane story, nature doesn't seem indifferent to humanity. It doesn't seem like this perilous thing. It seems quite lovely and quite idyllic. Again, it's pastoral. But if we wanted to talk for a few minutes about form, because I think one of the interesting things, again, within the form that Frost establishes, this moment of breaking or deviation, you'll notice the first three lines of the poem are basically an iambic pentameter. So for example, I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. Ten syllables, unstressed, stressed. The rhyming pattern, A, B, B, C. And then we see something quite similar with the next set of four. So Frost, he's, he's replicating or recycling that pattern with the second set of four lines, especially in comparison to the first set of four lines. But what's interesting is what happens in the final line. So lines four and lines eight. Because you'll notice if you try to read line four using that iambic pentameter that I mentioned earlier, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit because it's not in iambic pentameter. And the reason why is because Frost breaks it here for some reason. You'll notice, for example, again, I'll read line four. I shan't be gone long. You come too. So we're given this command or even this invitation. And what's interesting about this, it seems to suggest that Frost is, is quite literally speaking to someone, or perhaps part of the effect is that we want to imagine that Frost, he's speaking to us in this moment. You come too. And I want you to notice how this invitation for us to come, not only does it break the the poetic form, not only does it break the iambic pentameter, but by breaking it, it's, it's introducing this moment of perhaps excitement and spontaneity where something unexpected just happens. And so I want you to notice the thing that I want to highlight or the thing that I want to bring to your attention is how even though a few moments ago I spoke about how Frost is someone who, who possessed such reverence for poetic forms, that's not to say that he won't break them. 
for particular reasons. And I think part of the reason why he's breaking here is because he seems to enjoy and he seems to want his poetry to have these spontaneous moments. And one of the best ways to, to uh, create spontaneity is to depart from expectations. So here he's departing from the poetic form and the set of expectations that we as readers might carry after just reading the first two or three lines of the poem. But I think we could also talk a little bit about the speaker. And this is something you'll certainly hear me say, and this is something I want to discuss in particular as we read poetry. We should not always associate the author or the poet with the speaker or the speakers in their poetry, which is to say the, the person or the entity speaking may not necessarily reflect the sensibilities of the poet. I think it's interesting. We often do this with musicians as well. We often think that, well, if a musician writes a song, he, she, they, they're, they're writing something that projects their own feelings, emotions, and experiences. And that's not always true because musicians like poets can adopt personas. And one of the best ways to perhaps think through that is to think, well, who's the speaker here? What do they want? What are their values? What sorts of expectations? What, what sorts of assumptions do they make about the world? And I think this speaker is quite interesting because there is this, this collectivist gesture, I think, with this invitation because it's repeated. Lines four and line eight excuse me, line four and line eight, we see it in line four and line eight. I shan't be gone long. You come too. So it looks like here, maybe one of the assumptions we could make about this speaker is they, they want to uh, perhaps invite these sorts of moments of shared experience. It's not something it's not, for example, a situation where the speaker wants to be alone or wants to experience this in isolation. They, they want people with them. They want perhaps this, this experience to be not an individual experience, but a collective and a communal experience. And one of the reasons why I mention this and one of the reasons why I like it is because I, I like this idea that Frost in particular here, but... All poets, all writers, all playwrights, novelists, etc., what they ultimately want to do is invite their reader or invite their audience to, to join them on a journey of some kind. They, they are not just producing art for themselves. They're producing it as, as an attempt to create a community, to, to create something of a communal experience. And while I think that's often implicit in so much art, what I think is interesting here is how Frost makes what's implicit explicit. He just says it. This is for us. This is not just for me. So... There's a lot more I suspect we could say about the pasture, but I think that's where I want to leave it. Another question I would ask you to consider, and now at this point we're thinking about perhaps uh, symbolism, what, what particular images or ideas might ultimately represent. Why make reference to this calf and this mother? What's the, is this just a moment to perhaps add some details to the poem? Or could you imagine this calf and this mother functioning metaphorically, symbolically, and if so, how, and maybe why? So, okay, let us transition to the road not taken. Now, I gave you a, a question this week in the discussion forums, and I believe I described, I think Frost at one point described this poem as a tricky poem, because by his estimation, people were often and constantly misreading it. And the misreading goes or sounds something like this. This is a poem, this is a poem that perhaps has a mantra to it, which is, hey, don't do what the crowd does, right? Be unique, be an individual, be bold, 
drink Coke, whatever. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of Diet Coke commercials on Hulu, and, and I think those, and maybe you've seen them too. If you have messaged me, I would love to know what you think about them. But they they seem to carry a similar sort of message that that is best expressed in the misreading of this poem, which is, hey, be an individual, right? Don't, don't, don't do what, what the world tells you to do. Be weird, be idiosyncratic. But according to Frost, that's not what this poem is about at all. In fact, this is a poem that tries to interrogate this, this fallacy of choice. But let's read the poem together, and then I'll, again, mention perhaps a few interesting parts or a few interpretive choices you could make. And this is on page 230. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same." And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Okay, so again, just think about what I said a moment ago, those Diet Coke commercials that I'm seeing on Hulu. We should, we should celebrate those who take the road not taken, or we should celebrate those who are bold enough to see a road that no one has taken, and they take that road. But I think for someone like Frost... This is not actually how we should think about the choices we make. I, I think here Frost is being a bit ironic. He's being a bit funny and silly, even satirical, which is to say he's making fun of this speaker. And this might be one of those moments where the speaker of the poem doesn't necessarily reflect what Frost might feel, because I think what Frost is ultimately suggesting here, and I think this is best understood by just looking at the final two lines of the poem. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Because I think what Frost is ultimately asking us to consider is how we so often just make narratives out of nothing. Which is to say, we experience these moments in our lives, we make these choices, and then we retroactively construct a narrative to potentially justify those choices. Think about, for example, within romance and romantic relationships, this idea that certain people are destined for others. Now, I'm not, I want to be clear about this. If you are in a relationship and you are convinced that the person you are with was destined for you and vice versa. I'm not interested in telling you you're wrong. How could I know? But I think what Frost would perhaps say is, is that whole idea that she's the one, he's the one, they're the one, it has this effect of retroactively introducing a kind of stability in a world that is just incredibly chaotic and unstable. And again, I wouldn't suggest that having or possessing those kinds of beliefs is necessarily a bad thing. Anything any one of us can do to feel as if there's stability in a world that feels wildly unstable is, is not necessarily a bad thing. But I think what Frost would encourage us to at least consider and interrogate is the degree to which this is, again, a story we tell ourselves, a narrative we tell ourselves. And that, I, I would argue at least, and I think that's what Frost was 
asking us to consider when he described this poem as a tricky poem. I think that's the very idea he wants us to interrogate. And that's a that's a difficult idea to interrogate. Notice, for example, how confident this speaker sounds by the end of the poem. I took the one less traveled by. And that made all the difference. The speaker sounds so certain, so reassured about the choice they make. And, excuse me, about the choice they made. And again, part of the reason why they seem to have this confidence is because they've constructed this narrative over this choice. But I think for someone like Frost, again, just to get back to the poem itself, it's not that this person selected one of these two roads. I think for Frost, he would say, well, what if... What if the speaker chose the other road or, or, or took the other road? Well, what kind of narrative would he have constructed about himself then? It might have been something that sounded like this. Well, I, I, I took the road that everyone else travels, but look at how I was able to travel through this, this overpopulated terrain and look at how I was able to to transcend all of these obstacles and these limitations and now look at where I am on the other side again that's a kind of narrative too right and so I think again Frost's point with the road not taken is whatever choices you make it doesn't really matter that much because you'll construct this narrative afterwards that in some ways validates that choice. Even if you come to the conclusion that you made a mistake, you might say something that sounds like this. Well, I made that mistake, but you know, it's really important to make mistakes in life because that's an opportunity to learn. And while that's true, I suppose, it's also a kind of narrative that we tell ourselves as a way of perhaps justifying our mistakes, so on and so forth. So this is not, I suppose, a poem about, at least I think Frost would, would argue, and that's not to say that we should, we should trust him, because I think at that point what we're ultimately doing is assuming that the author really knows what they mean to say, which is not always true. But I think for someone like Frost, this is not a poem about taking the road less traveled, being rebellious, embracing individualism, so on and so forth. This is really a poem that attempts to dramatize just how good we are at constructing these narratives about the choices we make and how, how, how subtle that mechanism is and how we don't even often see that we do it, that, that so many of the explanations that we have to explain our choices or to explain anyone's choices are really just part of this larger narrative that we've just frankly made up. And again, that's not to say that we don't need these kinds of narratives, but I think for someone like Frost, he would much rather just have a kind of awareness about them instead of just using them and deploying them indiscriminately and without any real forethought. So, okay, so let's finally say a little something about stopping by woods on a snowy evening. And this is on page 233. And again, follow along with me. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep.'"
So maybe one of the first things I would ask you to think about is, well, what's the tone of this poem? Which is to say, and this is a word you can use and deploy when writing about literature. How does it sound? How does it feel? Because I think at times you could argue this is perhaps a regretful and a mournful poem. Maybe it's a defiant poem, or the tone is, is a bit defiant. There's maybe defiance here. But I think what you'll also notice, and again, this is perhaps something we, we see in many of the other poems I asked you to read for this week. This is a rather mundane, common, and unassuming setting. It's just a guy on a horse in the woods. Nothing particularly profound happens, but... Just like with the pasture, I would encourage you to perhaps look and search for those moments where perhaps even if it's small and subtle, something perhaps unexpected and profound does happen. But what's interesting is that it seems to happen less for this speaker and more for his horse. And I would, I would clarify one thing. When Frost uses a word like queer in the second stanza, he's not making a reference to sexuality, gender, or sexual orientation. When Frost wrote this poem, queer would have just simply meant strange. But the weirdness and the oddity of this poem, it's, it's something that the horse seems to experience, perhaps less so than our speaker. And something else I would ask you to think about with this poem is just, well, what is what does the horse represent, and why does Frost include the horse here? What does the horse do? And I think maybe one reading. I'll I'll offer one possibility, and just as a as a broad caveat for everything I've said today, all of these are are just readings and not the reading. So if if you disagree with anything I say, my God, I would love to hear it. I would invite those kinds of disputes and disagreements and and that's something that's that's one of the reasons why people still write about these kinds of canonical texts it's because there's no just singular or single agreed upon interpretation but i think one way of perhaps thinking about the horse is to think about the horse as as something for the speaker at least that's disruptive so i'll return to the opening stanza and read it one more time. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Now, I think if you just read that stanza in isolation without knowing the final stanza, you might come to the conclusion that, well, perhaps he's he's a bit mischievous he he seems to perhaps enjoy knowing that he's somewhere he should not be maybe he's a bit of a trickster figure and i think all of that's true to some degree but when you when you take this opening stanza and and put it within the poem's larger context especially thinking about how often he makes reference to sleep in the final stanza i think what we're ultimately getting here is a kind of respite, right? This is a person who uh, clearly wants to uh, stop traveling. He clearly wants to just have a break and take a break. And this is a convenient opportunity for him to do that. Again, to just enjoy this quiet, still moment in nature. So again, here, perhaps in contrast to some of the stories we read last week, Nature is not this potentially perilous thing. It is this comforting, inviting thing. But almost immediately, the horse disrupts him. And think about what the horse ultimately symbolizes here. The, whole, the horse perhaps symbolizes this impulse to continue pushing forward, maybe to continue working. And that tension carries throughout the rest of the poem, this extremely short poem, that tension between the, the speaker wanting to just stop and the horse wanting to continue. 
My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flakes. So perhaps, again, this horse for frost symbolizes something disruptive. Perhaps this horse... Is, is something of an antagonist to our speaker who wants nothing more than to just stop and rest and enjoy this sublime moment. But if you, for just a moment, place this poem in conversation with the Jack London story from last week, perhaps you could think of the horse and the dog from the London story as operating in a similar sort of way. Again, I'll return to stanza two. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. Now, while the speaker doesn't seem to acknowledge this, I think there's a way of reading this against the speaker, which is to say there's a way for us as readers to see what this speaker maybe doesn't see, which is just how dangerous and perilous this might seem, even though the speaker wants to convince us it's the complete opposite. And maybe that's what the horse senses in the same way that the dog from the Jack London story from last week sensed what the man could not. Now, if we pause for a moment and just consider the final stanza with what I said or what I with what I just said under consideration, I think, again, there's a couple of ways to read this final stanza. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. So if we wanted to imagine that, as I mentioned a moment ago, if we wanted to imagine that this speaker just wants this moment, this quiet, sublime moment in nature, perhaps even in isolation, in contrast perhaps to the busyness of his life, I think we could see the, the horse's constant provocations as something that clearly annoys the hell out of the speaker. And, and, and maybe that's part of how we could explain how defiant this final stanza might sound. He just wants a moment, but even his horse won't give it to him. But if we wanted to perhaps indulge in this alternative reading where the horse perhaps senses how dangerous and perilous this is, I think we could read this final stanza with a bit of irony. This is a, this is a situation in this poem where, unlike the man in the Jack London story, the speaker is, is acquiescing or the speaker acquiesces to his horse and he's, he's quite annoyed about it. But what he doesn't see, what he can't see, is that by doing so, perhaps he saved and preserved his life. Now, what's the quality of that life? I don't know, because this guy seems really busy and sleep-deprived, but he has his life nonetheless. So what I, what I hope this quick reading of this poem shows you is how you can't always trust what the speaker says. I think that's perhaps what this poem shares with The Road Not Taken is how the speakers want us to think one thing, but there's perhaps ways for us as readers to uh, conduct and perform alternative readings, readings that might seem more covert to the more overt reading. So, okay, with all of that said, I think that's where I want to stop. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And until we speak again, this is Colin Cox for Modern American Literature. I hope you have an amazing day.